Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> a little bit of cleanup here before we really get into the details of the lecture for the day. Um, the, you know, we did the lectures on stress equilibrium. And when we did so, we developed the stress equilibrium differential equations. As you probably recall, there were three of them. Um, d sigma xx dx plus d sigma xy dy plus d sigma x z dz plus the body force in the x direction is equal to rho times the acceleration in the x direction and then similar equations for uh, the y and the z direction so there were three of them at that time i mentioned or, or i may have uh, mentioned that they uh, there were equations in different coordinate systems i think i forgot to give those to you so I am here showing you those equations. These are those stress equilibrium equations in cylindrical coordinates. Now there's no need to rush and hurry uh, to write these down. You know, these are pretty widely available. They're in the textbook, I'm fairly certain. If not, they're certainly available uh, on the internet or uh, in my web, uh, in, I'm sorry, in my uh, course pack, electronic course pack or, or other places as well. But I wanted you to be aware that these existed. It's a useful tool, I think, to see them. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about these equations, as you look at, so for example, the top one, it's d sigma r, r, d, r. So we've now oriented ourselves into an r theta z coordinate system. So we're taking our derivatives with respect to r theta and z. And one of the things that shows up is this idea of one over r in the equation that uh, we had not yet previously seen. So this is uh, an interesting addition to the discussion. Here's another one over r term. Of course, there are one over r terms in all of these equations. So um, it's, it's worth noting that that's the case. And then last but not least, you need to then also conceive of what does acceleration in the radial direction mean? Well, that one we can deal with pretty easily. Um, what about uh, local accelerations in the theta direction? Yeah, we can probably think about that too, and z. Um, but these are no longer, or uh, they are still orthogonal coordinate systems. You know, r theta and z are orthogonal uh, to each other, uh, but they're not Cartesian. And so conceptually, I think that's just a little bit more challenging sometimes to think about. But as I said, these equations exist and uh, can be applied if you happen to be working in a different coordinate system. It's frequent that cylindrical coordinate systems are more convenient for us than uh, other coordinate systems. And then last but not least, uh, again, don't strive to write these down. Uh, just recognize that uh, there's a set of equations when we're working in spherical coordinate systems that apply. And again, it has this one over r term in it, uh, here, here, here. Um, we also get this cotangent of theta term, uh, which is kind of fun, shows up there. Um, uh, but anyway, it's it just notable that those are there. Okay, so that's uh, what we failed to clean up in that lecture. That was the end, I think, of what may have been called lecture six. I'm forgetting the numbers precisely. And then this is where we ended up at the end of last lecture. And as you recall, what we were doing last lecture was deriving the strain equations from the displacement equations. So if we have a displacement vector for a displacement field in a body, in a, some sort of structural body, uh, we can then compute the strain ultimately by taking a series of partial derivatives. And what was interesting about these, this is the last slide from where we ended off last time. So it only has epsilon yy and epsilon zz in it. Uh, there was also epsilon xx, which looked quite similar to this set of equations that is on screen. Um, but what we learn from this, or what we see here, is that if we have the displacement field, if we can write the displacement field, we can rather easily compute the strain field that assumes, uh, you know, differentiability of the displacement field. That means that the displacement field is continuous 
uh, to an appropriate level of derivative. Okay, um, so that means the derivatives are non-infinite. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is that the if if in the circumstance the derivatives become infinite, then our strain becomes uh, essentially undefined, and um, so that becomes one of the limitations ultimately of elasticity theory as it's being presented here in this uh, series of lectures. That is, is uh, the displacement fields have to be continuous. And we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit more uh, again later in this lecture. Okay, so what we derived was the normal strains. Uh, we also, of course, are gonna be interested in shear strains and uh, I believe this is where we left off. So if I'm wrong about that, please somebody chime in and tell me. Um, but when we're talking about shear, what does shear physically mean? Okay, so previously we have talked about normal strain. And normal strain, I think, is relatively easy for everybody to conceptualize. That's the stretching of a material as it's loaded. And it elongates in one direction. Or multiple directions. Now, shear, by contrast, uh, what does shear look like? Shear strain looks like a change in angle within a material. If you have a right angle, I guess I'll hold it like this for you guys. If you have a right angle and you apply a stress, a shear stress on one side and a shear stress on the other side, you would expect the angle between the previously orthogonal vectors to change. And so that's ultimately what we see as the uh, definition of strain, shear strain, that, that we'll use uh, in this uh, lecture. Okay, so this is pretty simple stuff. We take you know, previously that same vector that we had was O to A. So here's O, here's A. See if I can get my pen back, wake up pen. There it is. So there's O, <laughs> there's O and A. So that vector delta x is a differential length in the x direction uh, described by the vector OA. We can come up with an equivalent vector OB. So we have now a position B that's a small distance away from position A. It is uh, by choice now aligned with the y direction. And the distance between these two points O and B is going to be called delta y. So a small distance between... Uh, o and B. So this angle now, OAB, in the undeformed configuration is a right angle, okay, 90 degrees. However, then we apply the, whatever loads are present, the body begins to deform, and the angle changes. In fact, the length of the vectors potentially change as well, although for this purpose that's not quite as critical. Okay, so O, the position of O moves as we load it. It most moves from O to O prime. The position of A moves from A to A prime. The position of B moves from B to B prime. The angle changes. Now, of course, we've defined this right angle BOA. We will now define our shear strain, gamma XY, as being essentially the change in angle uh, of BOA from a right angle to whatever its new angle is. So 90 degrees minus the new angle BOA. Okay, so now like we did with the previous derivation, we would like to express this change in angle in vector terms. And ultimately, what we're trying to do, we're trying to accomplish, is to come up with a set of derivatives that represents this angular change within this body, this shear strain within the body. 
So what can we do? Well, we can use mathematical tools. There's nothing really fancy about this, but since we called gamma xy an angle or a change in angle, we can simply take the sign of the change in angle as a mathematical operation applied to it. And so sine of gamma xy is simply sine of 90 degrees minus the angle b prime o prime a prime, which, by the way, is equal to the definition of the cosine of that angle. And this is a pretty straightforward um, phase angle between sine and cosine type of argument. Okay, uh, sine and cosine are offset by 90 degrees from each other. Now, set that aside for a minute. This is separately. What we can do is we can take the dot product of two vectors. So this is a separate mathematical operation. So O prime B prime dotted with O prime A prime is, by definition, the magnitude of O prime B prime times the magnitude of O prime A prime times the cosine of the included angle, B prime, O prime, A prime. And so we can solve that for cosine of the angle. And what we get now is a right-hand side of the equation that is an, uh, it's a dot product of two vectors divided by the magnitude of those two vectors. Okay, so lo and behold, all said and done, the sine of gamma xy is going to be equal to O prime B prime dot O prime A prime over the magnitude of O prime B prime O prime A prime. Again, gamma xy, you can think of it as being a change in angle. It's a shear strain. Now expressed as a dot product. Uh, so Dylan asks, is gamma xy always positive? Uh, no, it's not. Good question, though. Uh, okay, so now let's just go ahead and, uh, um, you know, actually apply this set of equations. Okay, if you recall previously in our discussion last lecture, we said as O went to O prime, you know, from O A to O prime A prime, we said it went a distance du dv dw in the i, j, and k directions, and that there was a slight change on one of those variables. Uh, so dx plus du in the i direction plus dv in the j direction plus dw in the k direction. That's the new O prime A prime. And O prime B prime, now since it's oriented with the y direction in its original configuration, becomes delta u i plus dy plus delta v, j plus delta w, k. So the two vectors move similarly, but slightly differently from each other. All right, now that we've written the two vectors, we can... Um, then, of course, take the dot product of those two vectors. And uh, so that's an easy process. So uh, looking, we'll take du times dx plus du, and then i dot i is 1, plus dv times dy plus dv, j dot j is 1, plus dw times dw, k dot k is 1,
So the overall dot product of these two vectors is dx plus du, du, dy plus dv, dv, plus dw, dw. Okay, now, since we're interested in the angle, we don't really need to be overly concerned about the change in length of the vectors. So when we're computing the magnitude of these vectors, O prime, A prime is essentially still the, the original length dx. And O prime, B prime is essentially still the original length dy. So for that purpose of change of angle, we're not concerned about the change of length of those vectors. And so if you then apply that equation where we have the dot product over the magnitude of the vectors, the denominator now becomes dx dy, and the numerator becomes that dot product. And so that's written here. So the sine of gamma xy is going to be the dot product over the product of the magnitudes. Now this equation here is relatively easily simplified because we have a dx and a dx which can, can cancel. Uh, we have then a du over dx. Uh, we have, you know, all of those terms we can relatively easily manage. And then in the limit, as delta u, or I should say as delta x and delta y go to zero, we get then this equation. Which then simplifies to this equation. Okay, so in the end, what do we have? We have this equation. I'm going to try and box it. There we go. Let's look at the individual terms of the equation. Keep in mind, re remember the notational scheme that I introduced to you last lecture. That is the uh, comma subscript notational scheme. And I described it as representing the a partial derivative uh, with respect to a variable. So in this case, u comma y, the first term of the boxed e equation, u comma y is the partial derivative of u with respect to the x direction. v comma x is the partial derivative of v, that's the, uh, and just so you, we're all on the same page, u, v, and w, that's the displacement vector at that point. So partial u, partial y, uh, plus partial v, partial x, plus now these cross product terms, partial u, partial x, partial u, partial y, uh, partial v, partial x, partial v, partial y, partial w, partial x, partial w, partial y. Okay, and that's ultimately what the sign of this uh, angle, cha angular change is. I guess the last thing that I'll say here is what's already written on the screen. That's for the purposes of a small change in angle. Okay, this is a, keep in mind what this is. This is a deformation that's going on largely in a structural body. Now, if you guys have ever tried to deform something, um, you know, if you, if you have gone into the lab and pulled on a chunk of aluminum, you know that that tends to yield and then fracture at very small deformations, you know, a few percent at the most. So the change in angle that occurs is going to be a relatively small angle for most engineering materials. And so what we're going to say is that the sine of the angle is approximately, approximately equal to the angle itself. So that's just the small angle approximation you've seen so many times over the course of your careers. Okay, so if we pull all of this together, this gamma xy now is going to be equal to this equation up here. 
All right. Now we did that with our vectors, you know, in their undeformed configuration aligned with the x direction and the y direction. You can imagine, of course, doing the same thing with two vectors that are originally in the x and the z direction or in the y and the z direction, and therefore you're able to easily compute using that same logic three, three strains, three shear strains. <clears throat> so those are the shear strain equations down here at the bottom. We're going to call those gamma xy, gamma xz, and gamma yz. And I've also written, just to summarize the entirety together, the original normal strain equations, epsilon xx, epsilon yy, and epsilon zz. So these are the so-called engineering strain deformation equations. Strain deformation. This is the definite, by definition, these are the strain calculations we will use in this class. We've derived and now we'll use these as our understanding of strain. Now I'll mention there are some other definitions of strain when you get to even larger deformations. Um, you know, if you get to deformations that are on the orders of tens to 100%, um, then uh, we would come up with additional modifications to this. Uh, but for most of our uh, aerospace materials, this is the really good set of uh, definitions because most aerospace grade materials uh, don't have a large amount of deformation uh, before they fail. Things like composite materials, steels, aluminums, titaniums, magnesiums, they all tend to fail on the order of a few percent strain uh, rather than a hundred percent strain. Okay, the next thing I want to do is I want to look at these strains a little bit carefully. So the, I, I've written out two of them. One of them, epsilon xx, was the normal strain, which is by definition u comma x plus one half u comma x squared plus v comma x squared plus w comma x squared. And of course, gamma here we have u comma y plus v comma x plus now these product terms, these higher order terms. You know, notice that u comma x squared is similar to u comma x, u comma y. They're both products of derivatives, two, two derivatives multiplied by each other. So when, when the actual magnitude of those derivatives is small, those are negligible terms. When they're not small, then they're not negligible. But as we stare at these, both of these strains are quite similar to each other in their form. In fact, we can do a little manipulation, and I can multiply the top equation by 2, and I can now then say that we have almost identical forms to these equations. Okay, now what do I mean by that? So this term u comma x now shows up twice, one, two, because we doubled it. The one half, of course, canceled. U comma x becomes u, you know, this, this term now looks remarkably similar to this term. This term looks remarkably similar. This looks remarkably similar. In fact, the whole thing looks remarkably similar. So I previously had called the shear strain gamma, gamma xy. Now I'm going to redefine it going to give it another name, and I'm going to say it's equal to 2 epsilon xy. Now we have 2 epsilon xx and 2 epsilon xy, again, looking very similar. I don't know if you've ever heard of or seen uh, tensor strain notation versus engineering strain notation. If you've heard the words engineering strain, what we were talking about was this difference between gamma xy and epsilon xy. Okay, there's a factor of two difference between those two. One is called tensor strain, 
The other is called engineering strain. So the tensor strain is actually one half of the so-called engineering strain. Now, why do we do that? It turns out that it's really easy to go, go into the laboratory and measure engineering strain. However, tensor strain is much more easy to deal with mathematically. And so we tend to use tensor strain in our mathematical descriptions. Okay, note, of course, that what I did with gamma xy, I can do with gamma xz and gamma yz um, and uh, essentially define tensor strains for all of those shear terms. So the normal terms for engin engineering versus tensor strain are identical. The shear terms are a factor of two different from each other. I saw a couple of questions come in. Uh, this one's from Nicole. Is the second term on the right-hand side of equation 26 U or V? Uh, I believe these are right as written. I'm not seeing any errors in them, Nicole. Second term on the right hand side of okay. I was I was just wondering because um it looks like it's a v comma x on the um okay so I think I think what you're camera. asking is is uh, you're asking are these two terms correct and the answer is yes they are okay and really this is the difference between note note the subscripts here are on these are different as well okay you. Um, and this is the difference between normal strain and shear strain. So if I wrote these out longhand instead of in shorthand notation, epsilon xx would be the partial derivative of u with respect to x plus u comma. So two, I should say two times the normal strain is, is partial u partial x plus partial u partial x. Whereas, so that's the normal stretch. It's the, it's the change in length over length in the x direction. But when you look at the shear strain, that's the second of these two equations, it's partial u partial y, not partial u partial x. So it's partial u partial y plus partial v partial x. So it's okay. the der derivatives. So it's, uh, you know, one is a derivative uh, of the u distance with respect to the y direction, and the other is the derivative of the y distance with respect to the x direction. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so I, I in a previous slide, I had given you the uh, engineering uh, shear strain, or I should say engineering strain equations. Here on this slide, I'm giving you the complete tensor strain deformation equations. So again, these are the ones that we tend to use when we're describing the mathematics of the problem, uh, as opposed to describing the sort of laboratory-centric view of the problem. Now this actually becomes important in a few minutes, and I'll, I'll highlight the difference in, in a minute. Uh, so David asks, which one is engineering strain? Engineering strain is gamma. Tensor strain is epsilon. OK, a couple of uh, notes for you here. You know, it's worth noting that the higher order strain equations are completely consistent with the linearized versions that we had typically used. Okay, what do I mean by that? Let me go back one slide. The higher order versions, these terms, oops, uh-oh, 
<laughs> Come on. I'm trying to watch your screen. You know, I watch what you watch rather than what I have here. And it scrolls by very slowly on your screen. I feel like we're going in a circle here. Why is that? All right, I'm getting a little frustrated now. Okay, so this is where we were. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I think I might have to just drop the use of this tablet because it's just makes everything a little bit clunkier. It's easier to write with, but uh, certainly not faster. Anyway, okay, so here we go. So these terms here and these terms here, all of those, again, if we have small deformations, the derivatives are small. And then small numbers multiplied by small numbers become even smaller. So the higher order terms for small strains become small. And what's left is du dx, dv dy, dw dz, and what we now recognize is one half dv, <coughs> du dy, dv dx, or one half du dz, dw dx. These linear terms, linear terms are underlined. Those terms are the terms that we had given you in prior classes. Um, so uh, when the higher order terms become zero, uh, it's completely consistent with what we had previously provided you. Okay, and there are many circumstances actually where these linear versions of the equations are sufficient for our work, uh, although not all of the circumstances in structural mechanics that we deal with in aerospace. <clears throat> I'm going to highlight a few examples where that's not the case. One of them is stability analysis. When we do things like calculate structural stability, okay, structural stability is like the buckling problem. If you try and stand on an empty pop can, uh, eventually it will buckle and it'll just collapse. That type of calculation requires you to use these higher order uh, terms, even if the deformations are small. Alternatively, the um, if we have particularly large deformations, you know, on the order of two, three, four, five percent or higher, then the second order terms um, no longer are negligibly small in the calculation. Okay, so you now recognize that we have... Now, I, I've written six equations. Okay, I wrote six. Let me go back one more time to those six equations. Okay, I wrote epsilon xy is the first of the three shear strains. But you could have also written epsilon yx, which would have been one half v comma x plus u comma y, which just would have changed the order of these terms. But epsilon xy and epsilon x yx would have been mathematically identical. So really, there are nine terms here for strain. Really, we only focused on six of them. So much like stress, we have nine components of strain. Six of them are unique, and it's symmetric across the uh, diagonal of a 3 by 3 matrix representing that tensor. Uh, because of that, because it's a sec second rank tensor, that's symmetric, we can do the same type of principal value analysis, the eigenvalue analysis. 
we can calculate principal strains and we can calculate principal directions and it's done identically to what we did with the computation for stress. It's worth noting that the principal strains exist in a coordinate frame where the shear strain components are zero. So that's true, just like it was for stress as well. And now you can think of those principal strains as essentially being stretches in three orthogonal directions that are going on simultaneously. And in that frame, there's no change in angle. The last comment I'll make is that it's worth noting that stress and strain, really the principal stress and principal strain are not necessarily in the same direction. Okay, now they will be for a linear elastic isotropic material. Really, you should add that word here, isotropic. We'll go into what that means in a little while. But it won't be the case in general for an anisotropic material. Okay, I'm going to take just a pause for a moment. My, my, my uh, four-year-old daughter is actually making quite a lot of noise in the room right next to me. So I'm going to go shut her down. You guys take a moment to, uh, to catch up with your notes and think of any questions you may have. Hey, does anybody that has the app know how to actually make the slides look larger in the app? All right, I'm back. Um, I heard that question. Uh, I don't know that. I don't honestly know if I can do that. I'll look into that. I don't know who asked that, but. Uh, uh, that, that was Alex. I was thinking because especially with this lecture, all the U's and U's look exactly alike when they're about a millimeter in size on the phone screen. So. <laughs> uh, I, I can probably increase the font size. The challenge, uh, actually, so this is, of course, a bit tangential to our discussion for the day, but uh, the challenge of putting these uh, rather large equations on extremely small screens uh, is one that makes phones not ideal for the purpose. Um, if you have a tablet, that's perhaps a little bit better, or you can turn your phone sideways, and that sometimes helps. Um, so the, the font size is scaled to the size of the screen to try and keep it visible on the screen. Um, I, don't, I may have to revisit whether it should all be on the screen or whether it should be something you'd have to scroll on screen. I'm not sure which would be more annoying. Okay, so um, while I was gone, uh, did we have any other questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and continue. <clears throat> All right, now the next topic is this uh, topic of what's called displacement compatibility. Okay, it's, um, it's worth noting that displacements are not arbitrary. They need to conform to certain limits. That is if we want to apply elasticity theory as I've described it to you. Okay, and this comes from, uh, remember that idea of uh, the derivatives being finite. In order to calculate strain, we need to have finite derivatives. And when they become infinite, that really messes up our system. Okay, so that's part of it, but there's actually a little bit more than just that. Uh, now, we're not going to go into all the details of this because that's probably for a, another class. In fact, I would advertise the advanced structural mechanics class that's going to uh, be offered uh, 
in the uh, spring. And I hope I can get at least a few of you into that class, uh, which would be an extension of this class uh, sort of in much greater depth. Um, anyway, so the what, for, for our purpose for today, I'm willing to accept just the conceptual understanding of displacement compatibility that the displacement field must be single valued. Now, what, what do I mean by single valued? So I've drawn this kind of grid. So imagine this grid is overlaid on some structure that you uh, are, are deforming, you're applying load to. Now, in the grid, there's uh, these coincident points. It's actually one point which I've labeled twice. With So label A and label B are actually the same point on a body. Now, as we deform the body, the body is going to change shape. And in this case, I've represented that by an angle change. So deformation goes from here to here. It's important that all points remain essentially continuous, meaning A prime and B prime, the new locations of A and B need to be the same because they're the same point. What you can't get away with doing is having this crack form. Okay, so this idea over here where one point in the undeformed configuration maps to two points in the deformed configuration, that's, uh, that's against the rules, mathematically speaking. Now, you say, hey, now wait, wait, Dr. G, things happen, things break, there, you know, we get cracks, we get voids in material. Um, so what's the story? How come that how come that doesn't work? Well, and I would just then caution you, what we're actually introducing now is a new set of boundary conditions. Okay, we have new boundaries that didn't exist before. And so the problem that you formulated before, the elasticity problem in the undeformed configuration, doesn't exist anymore as it stood. It now must be reformulated accounting for the change, the, the new cr crack formation. So conceptually, that's something that I hope you guys uh, will take forward with you. And, and that's fair game. I could ask you that on an exam or something. Um, what I won't do is I, I won't get into the greater details of that. I will just introduce those to you here, uh, but then leave it for another day. Um, the, the sort of more rigorous mathematical understanding of this limitation. And you know, so that introduction is, is a simple one. It goes like this. To get strain from displacement, you know, I've, we've now written these equations. We need to differentiate the displacement field to get strain. Now, of course, you guys recognize when you differentiate, you lose information, i.e. any constants, rigid body motion. When you take the derivative, a constant goes away. And we're, com we're comfortable with that. That's okay. We, we like it. You know, we're used to it. Um, of course, to go the other way, if we're trying to actually compute displacement from strain, instead of differentiating, we integrate. Now, the challenge is, is that when we integrate, we need to now somehow recover those constants that existed before. And while we could integrate those six equations and get six integration constants, we don't have enough unique displacements to establish those integration constants, right? So if we get six integration constants, but we only have three displacements, we're short a few equations. Okay, so one of two things happens. We're either overdetermined, not physically possible for a real system, or we have some sort of redundancy within those six equations that brought up the six integration constants. So and that's actually what happened. So uh, those equations are now redundant. And um, so we need to add some additional constraints on strain. And to do that, I'll just very quickly, um, and you don't need to track this because I'm not gonna quiz you, on, or I'm not gonna test you on the mathematics here. But here I'm, I've written in a two-dimensional, we're going to imagine the two-dimensional field. So in that two-dimensional field, we have two normal strains and one shear strain. So normal, normal, and shear. The third one is shear. We can imagine uh, 
then manipulating that third equation, we can take derivatives of it. So I can take the derivative of it with respect to the x direction. That's uh, the first equation. I can take the derivative of the, that then subsequently with respect to the y direction. And so now here's what we have. This is uh, partial epsilon xy, partial x, partial y. And now this ends up being a constraint on the displacement field. Okay, I said we had six equations of them, only three unique. Okay, now we actually are showing that there is a relationship that makes those equations related to each other. Okay, so the six are not independent. So we'll we'll stop there. Um, I went through that fairly quickly. That's you know I'm not concerned if you didn't capture all of that in your notes. I, I I'm not gonna. Uh, make you do homework on that or, or write a quiz. But I wanted you to be conceptually aware of the fact that there's this mathematical constraint on the strain field uh, that requires those strains to not be entirely arbitrary. Okay. Um, I was just reading in the comments. Um, okay, I think uh, there's no questions related to the uh, lecture in the comments at the moment, so I'm going to move on. So that's the end of the strain displacement lecture. That means we can start what I'm going to call lecture eight. Lecture seven is concluded. We're a little bit off schedule with our lectures starting and stopping, but not a big deal. Um, so let, let me talk for a moment, big picture. Okay, one of the first things we did, well, the first things we did was sort of examine historical concepts and introduce you to the ideal of structural idealization. Okay, but then the, the first sort of real mathematical rigorous stuff that we did was we started to talk about stress. We talked about stress sort of in isolation of other things stress in and of itself, and then we talked about stress in its relationship to equilibrium. So there's a relationship between stress and equilibrium, the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments, that we have now derived. Okay, then we stopped talking about stress for a little while, and then we jumped into strain. And over the last lecture plus, we've now derived the relationship between strain and displacement. So we have strain displacement relationship. We have a stress equilibrium relationship. Both of those, by the way, are governed by differential equations, which make them quite difficult in many circumstances to integrate. Okay. But what's missing is the relationship between stress and strain. So far, we've completely isolated those discussions. So that brings us to Lecture 8, the so-called constitutive relationship. This is the relationship between stress and strain. Okay, go for a, a minute with me back a few lectures to when I introduced this sort of arbitrary structural body, which we've been calling the stress potato. Okay, that, that structural body had a set of constraints. Uh, so these, So this down here was a, a displacement boundary condition constraint. This over here was a load boundary con uh, condition constraint. Of course, this area A was uh, described as a um, 
uh, surface that we could expose by taking an equilibrium cut. Uh, here was some additional um, uh, loads that were on the other side of the cut. Now, I, I have not stressed the fact that these equations we're developing are so-called field equations. What do I mean by field equations? Okay, we referred to a displacement field, a vector that describes the displacement. And that vector was described in terms of a point within the body. We could describe the displacement of a point within the body. And in fact, every point within the body could potentially have its own unique displacement. So now, because the displacement field is a function of position, we are calling it a field quantity. Now strain, because it's derived from displacement, is also a field quantity. Stress <coughs> in the limit as we take an infinitesimal point is also a field quantity. So all of these quantities are field quantities. They are uh, applied at every point in the body. And it turns out that there are a lot of unknowns. Okay, there are three displacements. There are nine stresses of those. Six of them are unique. There are six strains, really, I guess, nine of those, six unique again. And so if we add all of these things up, we're now seeing uh, six unique stresses, six unique strains, three displacements, uh, 15 unique quantities. Uh, David, uh, this is a typo, this div. That's a typo, so just kind of cross that out for a minute. So in order to, so, and these are unknown, you know, potentially within a body. We need to be able to describe and calculate all of these quantities at every point. But in order to achieve 15 unknowns in our calculations, we're going to need to have 15 equations. So how many equations do we have? Let's take a look at that. Okay, so, um, you know, to answer my own question, we had, we need 15 equations. We now have uh, three equilibrium equations, and we had uh, symmetry equations, so that makes six, and then we had six strain displacements, so, so far we have 12. We still have a few more equations to achieve. Okay, so let's, uh, let's now look at how stress and strain are related. Uh, for a moment, Let's take a look at a, uni, uh, a uniaxially loaded block. So what I have here is a load frame. Uh, much This is a, not a photo of my load frame that's in my laboratory, but it's actually quite similar. So um, there is a specimen here in the middle that's being pulled in tension. So we're going to look at that specimen and see what happens. This is just an intuitive uh, description of the constitutive relationship, and then I'll introduce it to you mathematically. So if I were to apply a stress, and we'll call it sigma xx, so it's in the x direction, normal stress, and I said that that was not zero, but that was the only stress that I applied, what would you expect the deformation to be? And I'm sure most of you would uh, be able to come up with what we call Hooke's Law. That is that stress is equal to the modulus times strain. Uh, sigma xx is equal to E times epsilon xx. However, that's not a complete description of the strain that would result for most materials. What other strains are present? Wouldn't you have strain in the uh, y direction too? Uh, you would. And do we have a name for that? Uh, 
I just remember it has to do with Poisson's ratio. Uh, very good. So we actually call it a Poisson effect, or you could call it a Poisson strain if you wanted to. Um, and, and yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, we're talking about Poisson's ratio. We're ultimately going to describe that in a moment. So we could have rearranged that Hooke's Law equation and written it for epsilon xx. So that would simply be sigma xx over e. What are the other strains? I already asked you that question. Now I will write them for you. So epsilon yy would be minus Poisson's ratio nu times epsilon xx. Uh, ZZ, epsilon ZZ would be the same, minus epsilon XX, both of which now can be expressed as minus nu times sigma XX over E. So those are normal strains in what we've, in the past, you know, you, you've been familiar with these equations in the past, you've used them. What we didn't highlight is this is for an isotropic material. I'll define that more explicitly in a few minutes. Uh, so the normal strains are driven by Poisson's effect, and there are no shear strains present as we're sort of imagining this deformation. This is just our intuitive understanding. So epsilon ij is equal to zero. Those are shear strains when i does not equal j. Okay, so, you know, we can do that same thought experiment a number of times. We could pull a stress in the yy direction, setting all other stresses equal to zero. We get epsilon yy being equal to sigma yy over E, the modulus. We similarly get a Poisson effect, so we get epsilon xx and zz as being equal to minus nu sigma yy over E. And again, no shear strain. And we can do the same set of experiments again a third time, except now oriented in a z direction. And we find this entirely uninteresting result that epsilon zz is equal to sigma zz over e. We get a Poisson effect, so epsilon xx and yy are equal to minus nu sigma zz over e, and there's no shear. So none of that is um, terribly exciting. However, this is our intuitive understanding of what happens for many of the materials we use. And this is uh, sort of engineering 101. Okay, and, and what we have here in our, in, again, this is intuitive. This is not a derivation. This is an in, you know, in, intuitive description. Is we have this uh, pattern that applies that describes the normal stress to normal strain response. And also uh, the shear strain response is implicitly in there when we say it's equal to zero. Okay, now the, the question that I'll ask is what about shear? Now, not shear strain, but what if we apply shear stress? What happens to the deformation when we apply shear stress? We spent a good part of this morning's, uh, or I should say the, uh, the lecture of earlier this hour, uh, talking about how uh, shear ultimately leads to a change in angle. So here's what shear kind of looks like in a block diagram format. If I apply shear on two opposing faces, we get a change in angle. It's no longer uh, perpendicular corners. If I apply tau xy not equal to zero, but all the other stresses are zero, we get a shear strain gamma xy, and it is now proportional to the stress where that proportionality is one over G. So we have the thing called the shear modulus. So shear stress is shear strain times shear modulus. We can solve for shear strain and that's just shear stress over modulus. 
for our isotropic material description, all the other strains are zero. Three normal strains are zero, and the two other planes where we didn't apply the shear stresses, it's zero. Now, like we did for normal, we can just simply repeat that experiment in a different plane. So if we do it for tau xz, we get that gamma xz is tau xz over g, and the rest are zero. Again, not terribly exciting. And we can do it for yet another plane. Tau yz, and we get gamma yz is tau yz over g, with all the others being zero. Okay, so again, it's just an intuitive description of the response based on what we've taught you in the past and your understanding of how uh, sim simplistic sort of isotropic materials work. Um, it's worth noting, I, I assume you guys have heard this word superposition previously. If you applied multiple stresses simultaneously as opposed to one at a time, we can use superposition. Superposition is just a fancy way of saying we sum up the responses. Okay, and this is true as long as the response is linear elastic. Uh, we can't do that when uh, you get a nonlinear response, but for a linear response, we can use superposition. All right, so we went through a series of thought experiments. Let me summarize those thought experiments for you. What we imagined now was a, a strain response for a certain applied stress. A strain response for a certain applied stress. So we now know that there are six unique stresses. I've written those in a vector on the right-hand side. We know there are six unique strains. I've written those as a vector on the left-hand side. Imagine a more complex material. And that more complex material has a proportional response for every strain component for the application of any stress component. So if I apply sigma xx, because I have a coefficient s11, I get a magnitude of epsilon xx, that's regardless of what the other stresses are, but if I applied six stresses simultaneously, the, the strain response, epsilon xx, would be the sum of those six responses put together, the superposition of those six independently applied loads. And so now what we have is something called generalized Hooke's law, The material description we're using is something that we will now call an anisotropic material. And anisotropic, well, we'll get into the details in just a moment. Okay, so this is, this is a mathematical description that admits a more complex behavior than what you have seen before. That doesn't mean that all materials behave in a complex fashion. Um, but, it's, um, but it's worth paying attention to the fact that it could happen that way, that they could behave that complexly with that level of complexity. Is complexly, I don't think complexly is a word. Um, now, in the equations that I wrote previously, I wrote them with engineering shear strain, okay? What do I mean? If you look here, I've got gamma. As opposed to epsilon. That matters because it turns out that there's some symmetry to the material response that you will eventually discover much like there was symmetry to the stress and strain tensors, there's symmetry to the material tensor. And 
in order to write it the way I have written it, we have to be careful that uh, about making sure that that symmetry applies across the diagonal. Okay, um, so you can just pay attention to the fact that the way I wrote it in this case allows us to appreciate there's a six by six compliance matrix that is symmetric. Okay, rather than write out that whole thing in longhand, which I, I see some of you are scribbling down uh, and, and probably getting quite sore hands from doing so, um, we can write that in a, <clears throat> in a matrix form and it becomes more concise. So epsilon vector is equal to stress, I'm sorry, S, the S compliance matrix, uh, which is a six by six matrix times a six by one stress vector. The values that are contained in S by, by a convention are called elastic compliances because they are describing how compliant is the material to the applied load. Now, the set of thought experiments that we did did not have the level of complexity of the mathematical description that I've provided you. So now we can look at what would have been the case for a uh, isotropic material. This matrix in the square brackets is S. It is the compliance matrix. Now, however, this is for a relatively non-complex material that has no shear strain to normal strain coupling. It has um, uh, the Poisson effect tracked as a single constant using nu, and it has the modulus E present. So these, uh, these, this portion of the equation we derived directly in our prior examples, in our thought experiments. And this set of equations, now pay attention again, we got to always be careful. The way I've written it this time is I've written it in tensor notation, and so instead of being 1 over g, it's 1 over 2g. So whenever you see these equations written in this format, I want you to pay attention very carefully to whether it's written in engineering or shear strain or uh, tensor strain notation. So this is tensor strain notation. Because it's tensor strain, it has the 2 in it, 1 over 2g. And the symmetry just kind of comes because of isotropy because there's no coupling. So these off-diagonal terms are uh, zero. Um, so we don't need to worry about it being in the more general form. Now, this is what we're calling an isotropic material. So isotropic, what does that mean? That means, by definition, we actually only have two parameters that define the material's response to load. Those two parameters are nu and E. Now, in this equation, I've also written G, but G, nu, and E are actually related to each other, and I'll give you that equation in a minute. Okay, it's important that we're able to invert that system. You know, if we can calculate strain from stress, we should be able to calculate stress from strain. So, you know, you've got this six by one is equal to six by six times six by one. You should be able to invert both and get a new matrix. The matrix, we're gonna call that matrix C and we're gonna say that this is by convention called the elastic constants. And as a general statement, C and S, the compliance matrix and the elastic constants matrix are fully populated for an anisotropic material. This is the most general description of a material. It's got a bunch of zeros for an isotropic material. Uh, looks like I failed to see in the chat window a question from Nicole. Uh, Nicole uh, asked, what do you mean by no sum? Um, the, so that's back a couple of slides. I won't go back to the slides just because this tablet seems to be having trouble presenting those slides 
uh, easily. Um, but no sum, uh, it has to do with a notational scheme, which I didn't describe to you. So I left that, that term in there uh, so that if anybody who understood that notational scheme happened to come across these notes, they would, they would recognize that they're not supposed to do the implicit summation on the indicial notation. But since I didn't describe indicial notation, you can just neglect it, okay? It's not something you need to, need to know. Stick around for the advanced structural mechanics class in the spring, and, and I'll teach you all about it. I'll be excited to teach you. Okay. Uh, the other question, uh, Garrett asked, what does fully populated mean? That means, um, you know, none of the terms are zero. None of the terms are zero. So in an isotropic material, many of the terms are zero. In an anisotropic, fully anisotropic material, none of them are zero, fully populated. Uh, Amir asks, what's the definition of a linear elastic material? I'm a little confused on that. Great question. Thanks for asking, Amir. Uh, a linear elastic material, if we take a stress and strain response, a linear elastic material is linear. Elastic means that all the energy is recoverable. Now, by contrast to a, a linear plastic material, which exhibits some sort of yield, that would be the second line that I've drawn. And if you get to this point and then unload, whoops, use my eraser. If I get to this point here and unload, it unloads back down along the same slope. But now we've got this permanent plastic strain and we've done work. That's energy under the system. So uh, if when it's linear elastic, elastic means it unloads along the same line that it loaded Whereas the opposite of that, if it's not elastic, it unloads along a different path. So good questions. Uh, for an isotropic material, so I showed you the matrix of elastic compliances for an isotropic material, which had a bunch of zeros in it. Um, for an isotropic material, the matrix of elastic constants, this is now C. So remember we had written sigma is equal to C times epsilon. This is now C. And again, you can see it has a lot of zeros. Note that there's a, another way to express that matrix um, with something called the LeMay constants. There was a, a mathematician, I believe he was French, LeMay, who developed these coefficients that simplified the notational scheme. So uh, this, you can see the, the amount of space in handwriting this takes is less, but in order to do that, you have to define these new set of constants that we're less familiar with. So it's worth noting we've talked about E, and we've talked about nu, and we've talked about G. All of these are laboratory-centric co uh, constants. They're, they're values that are very easily measurable in the lab, whereas mathematically they aren't necessarily the most convenient. So the LeMay constants tend to be a little bit more convenient for the mathematics, um, but less intuitive in the laboratory. And the last thing I'll say for the day, we talked about this relationship between the shear modulus and the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. I said only two of those three are unique. Here's the equation that relates shear modulus to Young's modulus and Poisson.
All right, I think that this is a good place for us to take a break. It's 3.53. Uh, we'll pick up again uh, with the remainder of this lecture uh, on next Tuesday. I'll hang around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, otherwise, have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you guys uh, next week.